Hello, and welcome to Mayor Brown's Arbitration and Energy Three Recent JOA Developments Webinar. My name is Mike Lennon, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Houston office and a member of the International Arbitration Group and Oil and Gas Practice Group. Joining me today as co presenters are Mark Stefanini in our London office and Gustavo Fernandez in Brazil. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, please note when accessing Mayor Brown webinars via our ON24 platform, we suggest avoiding use of desktop virtualization software such as Citrix to decrease the disruption or quality loss. Secondly, as listed under the FAQ widget on the right side of your screen, today's program is being streamed through your computer, so there's no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, make sure you use your computer speakers or a headset plugged into your computer, and you can adjust the volume as you see fit. If you have any questions that are unanswered during the presentation, I invite you to submit them using the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen. We will do our best to follow up with you directly after the webinar has ended. Our aspiration, however, is to try to leave maybe five or ten minutes at the end so that we can try to tackle some of the questions you submit in the Q&A bar. Regarding CLE credit, we will be providing an alphanumeric code during the presentation. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's programs. These forms are also available to download on the right-hand side of your screen under Resource List. With that said, let's get started. So, <clears throat> the program today, we're going to cover two uh, recent cases under English law because, as many of you uh, appreciate, English law is frequently the governing law of uh, petroleum contracts in the international space. And we're going to cover a third uh, matter arising from an LCIA arbitration under Brazilian law. Why is it important? Oil and gas uh, lawyers have long feared um, <laughs> evolution in both an English law and civil law systems, and in particular for the Brazilian law case. Oil and gas lawyers have long feared that the default and forfeiture of interest clauses in JOAs might be unenforceable in civil law systems. In the case that Gustavo is going to comment on, the tribunal upheld the validity of the clause. And that's good news because AIPN commentators and in the official notes, for example, to the 2012 model form, uh, the, the concern about unenforceability is specifically noted. So with that, uh, let me hand over the uh, baton to Mark Stefanini to discuss the Spirit Energy case. Hello, everyone. Um, it's Mark Stefanini in, in London here. I'm going to talk about Spirit Energy and Marathon. Um, this this case is an, it's an important demonstration of the way in which the English courts approach questions of interpretation, their aim being to deal with potential areas of ambiguity whilst retaining fidelity to the party's bargain. And, and in this decision, the Court of Appeal performed a textual analysis of the relevant provisions of the JOA and the UUOA and construed this in light of the commercial context as per the leading English authorities on contractual interpretation. It's very clear from the quote that you'll see on the slide that the Court of Appeal reached a firm view regarding the context in which the relevant provisions were to be construed in relation to um, this particular agreement, of course, but I think a lot of their commentary will you know, be pertinent to JOAs generally. Um, and, and what they said amounted to a fundamental endorsement of the no profit, no loss principle 
um, it's therefore likely that you know courts are going to approach this from a similar perspective, at least English courts, in future. In terms of the factual background to the dispute, the claimant was the operator in a North Sea JOA and the defendants were the other participants. Now, with the approval of the operating committee, the operator had engaged employees in connection with joint operations and provided them with a defined benefit pension. The costs of those operations, including the costs or at least the anticipated costs of the defined benefit pension contributions had been included in Bray management plans, which were the annual operating program approved by the relevant operating committee. Of course, as has been the case with so many defined benefit schemes, the pension scheme suffered from a funding deficit, which was in excess of 68 million pounds. The operator sought to recover those costs from the other participants in proportion to their participating interests. And initially, for some years, in fact, the participants agreed to make payments to repair the deficit, but they eventually ceased payments and argued that they had no further obligation to pay and the whole amount should be borne by the operator. And quite unsurprisingly, the operator then brought a claim. The participants lost at the first instance and appealed to the Court of Appeal. And by the time the claim reached the Court of Appeal, the issue in dispute was whether the other participants were liable to pay in the absence of a further decision of the operating committee approving the unanticipated costs, and if so, whether the operating committee was obliged to provide that approval. Now, in terms of the contractual framework, um, the JOA adopted the, 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 you know, the contractual framework which most people on this call, I imagine, will be familiar with, with an operating committee approving budgets for the following 12 months and costs being dealt with via an accounting procedure. The key elements of the JOA being construed in the case were Article 7.2, which concerned the advance approval of budgets. And you can see a quote from Article 7.2 on the slide in italics in the first bullet point. And essentially, the crucial issue in dispute was what was meant by the operating committee being required to agree a budget to include as a minimum the work required to be performed during the budget period and the requirements of the operator having regard to previously approved programs and budgets and its operations. Now, there were a couple of other clauses that were of interest. Article 10, which, which was the article that provided all costs of all operations would be divided between the participants in proportion to their participating interests and, and applied an accounting procedure. Now, the accounting procedure began with an overarching statement of purpose, which, which, which stated that the purpose of this accounting procedure is to establish equitable methods for determining charges and credits applicable to all operations conducted in accordance with the agreement, under the agreement, and to provide that the operator neither gains nor loses by reason of the fact it acts as operator. So there was an express statement of what we all know to be one of the um, you know, fundamental tenets of, of operatorship under a, a JOA. So, in terms of the arguments, the thrust of the participants' argument was that absent some specific approval by the operating committee of the unforeseen costs in a budget, the operator was not entitled to payment. And what the participants said is they said, the JOA draws a clear distinction between three different approval methods for payment. There are revenue items, which include the present pension costs and require the approval of an annual budget. There are capital items, which were subject to a different authorized AFE process, and extraordinary items such as safety, emergency items related to safety, which didn't require approval. And they said, it was clear that the unforeseen pension costs did not fall within extraordinary items 
and that the approval of revenue matters was limited to costs which were incurred during the following 12 months, whether or not the operations which were being approved um, you know, actually went on for longer than that 12 month period. Basically, any cost which arose outside the 12 month period being approved by the operating committee as part of each annual budget, they said required further approval before it was payable. And it was argued that this interpretation made commercial sense because it would, be, it would make it incumbent upon the operator to take all steps to bring any unanticipated cost to the attention of the operating committee at the earliest opportunity and to take steps to limit them. And then at that point, the issue as to how much of that cost should be borne by the participants would become a matter for commercial negotiation, which would be sorted out in the spirit of the joint venture. And they said un any other approach would amount to writing a blank check for the operator, because once a course of action was approved, the operator was effect would effectively be entitled to spend the participants' money with impunity. So what did the Court of Appeal decide? On a textual analysis, the Court of Appeal decided that the, um, the effect of the joint operating agreement was clear. First of all, the deficit recovery charge arose out of approved operations. And Article 7.2, which we looked at, used mandatory language and the reference to having regard to previously approved operations did not, as the participants had argued, import any discretion as to the requirements of the operator that the operating committee were to take into account. What it meant it was it simply referred back to the source of the things that the operating committee were required to approve every year, i.e. they had to approve the ongoing costs of obligations that had been approved under previous programmes and budgets. It followed that Articles 10.1 and 10.2, which referred to the accounting procedure, were sufficiently broad in scope to cover the relevant contributions, referring to all costs. No attempt was made in the agreement to distinguish between costs that were certain in amount and estimated costs, or costs which might increase in future, as the participants had argued. And further, the, the court found that the statement of purpose set out in the accounting procedure did properly reflect what the parties had intended when entering into the agreement. Moving on to the contextual side of the decision, the court also expressed very clear views on the contextual arguments made by the participants. I mean, as you can see from the, the quotes on the slide, what these indicate is that a party seeking to run arguments contrary to the no profit, no loss principle are likely to face an uphill struggle in convincing a court that a JOA agreement was not intended to incorporate this principle. This will likely you know, require some very specific facts or express wording. Um, in order to convince a court that this, you know, the, the immediate case is an unusual one, in which, which is different to the approach taken here. And in particular, the court roundly rejected the blank check argument put forward by the participants. And the court pointed out that there was sufficient protection available to the participants through two mechanisms primarily. First of all, the need for the operator to show that prior approval had been given to the relevant operations for a cost to be recoverable, i.e. that the head of cost was approved and reasonable estimates and so forth were obtained at the time and provided to the operating committee. And then this was combined with the need for the operator to act honestly and in good faith in the relation to the exercise of any discretion it had with regard to the unanticipated cost. So, I guess the main takeaway is that the parties are in it together, as I say on the slide, so far as the English court is concerned. One interesting 
factor um, about this case was that the, the JOA in dispute did include a cost overrun provision, but it was limited in scope to decommissioning costs. It probably is, however, relevant to consider whether a standard form cost overrun provision would be likely to have changed the outcome. Um, I think there, there are a few, there's a couple of references to some cost standard cost overrun provision, provisions on the slide. I mean, I think obviously a question like this will depend on the wording of the, the precise wording of the clause. But looking at those standard provisions, what they do is they focus on imposing an obligation on the operator to promptly notify the operating committee and seek further an approval when an overrun of more than X percent is anticipated. What they don't engage with directly is what happens if the overrun has in fact accrued by the time it becomes apparent there will be an overrun, which really is what has happened in this case. Um, so for the reasons set out on the slide, i.e. The fact that the op ultimate the operator had no option but to pay for the pension deficit, as at the moment it became apparent that it existed, it's questionable whether the existence of cost overrun provisions of this nature would have had the effect of passing liability to the operator. However, what they would have done is provided more of an opportunity for the participants to apply pressure to the, on the operator regarding matters such as when the deficit became apparent or when it should have become apparent and whether from that point onwards the operator took all reasonable steps to seek approval of the cost overruns to be incurred and to mitigate the cost on, on the part of all the participants. So I think, you know, whilst the decision might not have been different in this case, I think a well-drafted cost overrun provision certainly has an impact on questions of this nature. Then the final slide on this, on this case is really just it's some food for thought in terms of you know, things to think about in light of this decision. So it might be worth thinking about whether there are similar latent cost issues in relation to any project that, that you're working on. And if this is a possibility, it's worth thinking about how the cost overrun provisions might apply and whether this is something that ought to be raised with the operator or other participants sooner rather than later. And of course, that requires careful thoughts because the early identification of an issue like this might result in additional opportunities to mitigate costs, or it might affect who ultimately bears liability for those costs. And that analysis will need to be worked through in order to work out whether, in fact, it's beneficial to um, to raise the issue. So that was what I was going to say on on Spirit Energy. I'll hand over to Mike to talk about TACA. Mike, are you there? I am here, but I had not unmuted myself. How about that? So. Uh, TACA uh, uh, was decided earlier this year by the commercial court, so the first instance. Um, the case concerns an express and on its express wording, unconditional right on the part of the non-operators to remove the operator. In this case, it was simply a majority vote in the joint operating agreement to replace the operator. And in particular, what we're going to focus on is the commercial court was forced to confront the applicability of the Braganza doctrine, uh, which impliedly limits the exercise of an unconditional right. And just to set the stage for this, English law does not, as a matter of routine imply a duty of good faith and fair dealing in a contract unless you have a special relationship of confidence and trust. So the Braganza Doctrine is effectively another way to good faith. Background here is 
important because you all have probably seen these situations. Uh, up until July 2019, Marathon was the operator of the Brayfields in the North Sea. Marathon is probably known to all of you, a well-known company, substantial worldwide oil and gas experience both on and offshore. But <clears throat> in a deal that closed on 1 July 2019, Rock Rose Energy PLC completed the purchase of 100% of the shares of the UK LLC that Marathon owned, and it was renamed as Rock Rose Energy. <clears throat> Haka and the other non operators formed the view that Rock Rose might not be up to the task, uh, both operationally or financially. And you can well imagine that if you get a relatively new uh, entity coming into a project that's not Marathon Oil Company, uh, you would be right to do some diligence about whether or not they were up to the task. <clears throat> Having done that diligence, Taka proposed that it should become the operator, and the other non-operators agreed that that was in their best interest. And they voted unanimously to substitute Taka as the operator full compliance with every procedural step in the joint operating agreement. And Rock Rose sued. And the operator argued that removal of you know, them as operator was subject to a number of qualifications. It tried to make both an express language of the contract argument, and then it also tried to use implied terms both the Berganza and the more traditional implied terms uh, concept. Berganza has its origins in a series of decisions involving uh, relationship type contracts, such as employment contracts or insurance contracts, where the distribution of bargaining power was rather uneven. And so the English courts developed a view that in those kinds of situations, the exercise of a contractual right, albeit seemingly unconditional, comes with a duty to exercise that contractual right honestly and in good faith and genuineness and not arbitrarily or capriciously or irrationally. The situation That line of cases developed to 40 plus years ago but it has started to creep into commercial contracts. As you see, the operator here making an argument based on Braganza that you would not normally expect because the duty of good faith doesn't apply to just the typical commercial contract. Complicating the Braganza problem is that there is a split in authority in England, starting with a case called Mid-Essex Hospital, which held that in circumstances where the right was unconditional, Berganza didn't apply. Um, and so basically you've ended up with a mixed bag of uncertainty about when Berganza applies or when it doesn't. But this is the first time the issue has been tested that we know of in uh, the context of a petroleum contract and particularly a JON. So I want to start here with the court's approach to construction of the JOAs, and I'm not going to just read the slide to you because you can all read the slide. Um, but what is important is that the court's approach returns to the predominantly textual approach to contract construction that had dominated English law over the years. Simply put, words matter. What you say and what you write in an agreement between sophisticated parties will govern the day unless there's some fundamental reason why uh, the court should depart from that approach. So applying this approach, <clears throat> the court considered the operator removal provision in accordance with the unambiguous language examining the entire agreement and taking account of related provisions. 
considering the object and purpose of the contract. And it's clear in this quote here that the court really didn't think too much of the arguments that were being made to try to get around a clear and unambiguous operator removal provision. <coughs> and the final point there, uh, I think, is helpful for uh, industry participants enforcing their JOAs in that there's no standard industry practice around limiting the ability to remove an operator, right? So you, you have your four cause provisions, which have different requirements, and then you have, uh, in many cases, a unanimous vote or majority vote provision that doesn't require the operator to have done anything wrong. And the court here is saying, look, there's there's just not a practice here in the industry that I'm going to that I'm seeing that would say the plain language of the JOA should be departed from. Now the brigands argument. The operator tried to argue that this was a relational contract in the same vein as an employment contract or the like because of the nature of the relationship between the operator and the non-operators because it's expressly not a partnership or joint venture, etc. Uh, and the, the non-operators and the operators owe duties to each other, um, it should be treated as a relational contract to which the Braganza doctrine applies. And the court said, no thanks. It's not necessary to imply a Braganza term into the contract. And uh, the reason necessary is bolded there is because the traditional test under English law is that an implied term must be necessary to make the contract work as the parties intended. And that historically has been a very high bar to overcome. There has to be some fundamental flaw or gap in the contract under English law before the court is going to imply a term. Second, uh, applying another long-standing principle for implying terms, the Berganza term would be inconsistent with the express terms of the JOA. And historically, when there is an express term, implied terms are not allowed. The Braganza Doctrine has no application to unqualified rights where a contract is, you know, drafted by people expertise in the industry with the particular agreement that's being drafted. <clears throat> What are the implications here? What are some of the broader takeaways? Well, <clears throat> the implications are broader than just for removal of operators. You can imagine uh, situations where uh, other petroleum contracts have similar types of unconditional terms. And the takeaway then is that the JOA will mean what it says. When the terms are clear, unambiguous, and make commercial sense, they will be enforced. And I'm going to just uh, take a bit of a of a a moment here to talk about an example of my own practice in which this duty was enforced. Uh, to override an unconditional uh, contractual right. It was a contract for the provision of personnel services. And the provision in the contract relating to invoicing had very strict deadlines. It had a 90-day deadline for submitting the contractor's invoices and a 150-day deadline for submitting third-party charges uh, for payment. And the provision held that at my client's option, they could refuse to pay the invoices if they weren't timely submitted. And that situation, in fact, happened. Uh, invoices were not timely submitted. My client rejected them. 
unfortunately, we were not in the English courts and did not have the benefit of the TACA decision. And a LCIA arbitration tribunal determined that the Braganza doctrine, in fact, applied. Had I had the benefit of the Taka case, I think the outcome would have been different. So there are any number of scenarios in which uh, parties are going to try to argue the Braganza doctrine. And I strongly encourage you to watch this space carefully because um, you know parties are going to make this argument. Let me now turn it over to Gustavo Fernandez to talk about his interesting case arising under Brazilian law. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, thank, thank everyone. Uh, I'll be addressing here a specific case that we had regarding Brazilian law. It seems to be an interesting one. Uh, regarding uh, the interpretation of a specific provision of the JOA, the A4B, uh, and uh, just uh, we'll make a, a, a I'll make a brief overview of the issues and how the both the uh, uh, Brazilian Petroleum Agency and the federal courts here in Brazil have dealt with the issue here uh, applying our law. Uh, first, uh, just a, a, a very, very broad review of the, our legal framework here in Brazil. Uh, uh, the exploration of the oil and gas activity in Brazil goes back to the 1950s with, uh, with Petrobras, a state-owned company. Uh, uh, and up until 1995, it was the, the only company that could uh, explore the activity here in Brazil. Uh, in 1995, this monopoly has been broken, and uh, from that period of time to now, we we witnessed really here a, a big uh, expansion of the market, and now we have uh, the major players of the oil and gas industry are here in Brazil. Uh, and the, the 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 national agency has been created by a law of 1997. And then basically, NEP acts both as, as the regulator uh, of the of the industry in Brazil, and also is a party to the to the concession agreements uh, that we have here for the uh, for the activity. Um, and uh, and of course, uh, considering that the, 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 at least the, the most of the uh, of JOA standard contracts. Are, uh, uh, have not been drafted specifically to to, to deal with uh, with civil law jurisdictions. It's a it's a it's a standard contract that uh, that uh, aims at uh, 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 to have its application regardless of a specific legal system. But it's of course it has been drafted with great care to be compatible with uh, with uh, all the major uh, major systems. So. Uh, of course, uh, in the case that uh, we uh, uh, are handling here, uh, the issues of compatibility of the JOA with the Brazilian law uh, uh, emerged, and that led to a, a variety of decisions, both arbitral decisions and, and, and court decisions, uh, dealing with the specific matter. And, and of course, there were many issues regarding the uh, uh, enforceability of JOA provisions. But uh, I will highlight some of them here for our, our brief discussions. Uh, uh, the, the main one is whether the, uh, uh, the JOA uh, for feature provision, whether that would be compatible with Brazilian law. Uh, also, uh, the, the, the right of, of set-off uh, rule of the JOAs, the rule that uh, a party must pay first and, and discuss later, which is a, is, a, is a core principle of all the JOAs, so what was also discussed in the context of the, of the dispute, and whether uh, the specific for feature uh, provision could be regarded as a penalty clause, and therefore there would be several implications arising of that, especially uh, given that in that situation, if the provision would be read as a, a, a penalty clause, then of course there would be a discussion of whether a, a, a compensation could be due to the uh, to the breaching party. Uh, and, 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 and the issues that emerged there 
and 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 uh, were examined uh, and favorably to the to the validity of the provisions was that uh, uh, first uh, the arrangements that the parties uh, uh, can uh, use can utilize in the JOA provisions are as long as it, uh, they refer to economic rights they can be freely negotiated and disposed of. So there's, uh, in, in, in according to some of the decisions, there's nothing in terms of Brazilian public policy that would prevent parties to regulate uh, uh, provisions as 84D that deals with forfeiture provisions. Uh, also, as long as the uh, traditional elements for the validity of, of a contract under Brazilian law are met, uh, uh, that is, capacity of the parties, legality of the subject matter, and uh, observance of any formal requirements, uh, as long as this has been observed, there's nothing illegal, nothing uh, uh, invalid on a provision. Um, uh, also, another issue that uh, normally emerges is whether this provision can be regarded as some sort of, of, of deprivation of, of property without due process. Um, and, and at least from the decisions that we have uh, uh, we got, that we have identified so far, uh, considering the, the, the proceedings that have been carefully drafted into the J-Way, uh, they, as they confer plenty of opportunities to any of the parties to discuss the cash calls, uh, as they, they confer the parties plain opportunities to present their case and to and discuss the, the cash calls. As long as the cash calls are paid first and then discussed later, there is nothing uh, illegal in, 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 in any of these provisions. Uh, for the same token, uh, 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 an issue that emerges with some frequency in the Brazilian law is uh, is whether uh, the um, the forfeiture provisions could be regarded as invalid under doctrines such as unjust enrichment or good faith. And again, the the decisions that we have viewed so far. Uh, are to the country. They they also have upheld the, the validity of the provisions even under those allegations. Uh, on the issue of the uh, of whether the forfeiture provisions could be regarded as a penalty, as a penalty clause, uh, uh, a couple of issues have been uh, uh, considered in order to have a, a decision on the point. Uh, the, first, the first issue that emerged was whether, what is the nature of, of, of these pro feature provisions of the J-Way. Uh, and, and the majority of them stand and seem to point in the direction that sees that is a, an option that the, uh, that the non-defaulting parties have at their disposal uh, to require the defaulting party uh, to withdraw from the JOA. The second point is, is the very nature of a, a, a penalty clause. Uh, in, in, at least under Brazilian law, uh, the, the penalty clause have at least two main feature, uh, features. The first is to, to pre-establish the amount of damage that will be paid uh, to liquidate the damage that we pay to the non-defaulting party. And second, it serves as a way to deter uh, breach. It has a function to avoid that the party considers the possibility of breaching a, a contract. And, and in the case here, if the forfeiture provision were regarded as a penalty clause under Brazilian law, uh, the problem that this construction would raise is that the provision would, to a certain extent, instead of being a deterrent against breach, it could uh, stimulate parties to, to incur in, in what is sometimes regarded as strategic defaults. Uh, in other words, if, for example, a participant in a JWA has no longer an interest in, in continuing to, to invest in the project, 
uh, he could, for example, simply stop paying the cash calls in the hope to discuss some sort of compensation after the breach. Uh, and that would uh, 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 lead to the, to the uh, uh, unfair situation in which the uh, that have been used in order to set aside the, the, the interpretation of, uh, of, of the feature provisions as a, some sort of, of, of a penalty clause. Uh, moving here, uh, 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 the, uh, the really interesting part uh, about the discussion is how the Brazilian uh, uh, petroleum agency, how, how they have dealt with the issue, and they have dealt with the issue uh, last year in the proceedings uh, regarding the, uh, the, the compulsory assignment of, uh, of one of the parties' interest in a JOA. And, and what the agent decided was that their, the, the scope of their review is, is very limited. Uh, they do not enter into the into into any of discussions of the merits of the JWA disputes. Uh, this is entirely up to the parties and to the actual tribunal in charge of the case to decide. Their their review is simply to identify if there is evidence that cash calls were issued that they have not been paid. Uh, that notice of withdrawal ha uh, has been issued, and and there has been no cure of the of the default, and that there is a valid power of attorney under the JWay. So uh, uh, according to NPA's position, if those requirements are met, unless there is a court or arbitral decision to the contrary, they will enforce a provision of. Uh, of J way as the, the feature provision as the standard clause of 84d uh, which I think is a very very promising news for the Brazilian market because uh, definitely the the forfeiture provision is is regarded by many as the most so to speak controversial provision in civil law system because of the peculiar nature of the provision and uh, which uh, which may raise some 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 concerns for those who do not understand how the provision should be applied in in, in practical terms. But with the green light of NP in in, in in their decision goes even further in saying that uh, provisions like that like those are key to 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 to, to put Brazil in line with the best uh, international practice. So their position seems to be a, a, a good indication that uh, a standard contract as the as, as JOA AIPN model contract will be enforced in, in, in Brazil. And, 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 and also their, their decision, uh, uh, the, it, it hasn't been, uh, it has been challenged. It has been challenged in Brazil. He has been challenged before uh, uh, a federal court, uh, not yet on the merits, but uh, on the interim relief basis. And 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 the federal courts also have confer have, has confirmed the MP's decision that at least on a preliminary basis, there is nothing uh, uh, illegal on MP's decision to determine the assignment of the of a uh, uh, defaulting party's interest. Uh, applying the JOA, and, uh, and and the decision is still subject to an arbitration, a discussion on the merits. But so far, what the uh, the update on Brazilian law on that specific point is that both the regulator, the NP, and uh, and the, and the federal courts and the, the the federal circuit here in Rio de Janeiro have both. Uh, confirm at least for the time being the validity of that uh, provision. Uh, well, uh, this is in summary what uh, I wanted to, to to highlight and update it to you all. Uh, so I, I believe, Mike, that uh, um, maybe we should now open up uh, the, the the floor for for questions so that uh, the, the the audience can participate as well. Thank you, Gustavo. I agree. So we're going to look at 
um, at taking your questions and we have the Q&A tab that you can enter your questions. So why don't we take one from Felipe Bocum. And the question is regarding the case of the JOA default provision, does the JOA have other remedies besides forfeiture? Was it discussed whether there were other less onerous remedies available, such as a withering interest that could be used? Um, this was your case, Gustavo, so I'll let you take the first crack at that, but uh, Mark and I may chime in after, uh, after hearing your thoughts. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Mark. The, the question is very good. You know, uh, 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 as probably most of you know, uh, the JOA AIPN model has uh, four versions. In 1990, in 1995, in 2002, and the 2012 versions. Okay. Uh, and the 1990 version had only the forfeiture provision. Uh, on the uh, 1995 model, they added a, a secured interest provision in addition to the forfeiture. Uh, in 2002, they have added also an option of a buyout provision. And in 2012, they have uh, added the, the withering provision. So we have at least now four different uh, 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 ways to remedy the breach of the cash call. So we have forfeiture, we have buyouts, we have withering and security interests. We have all these options at the moment. But, the, uh, uh, but what I think it's important to highlight here is that the forfeiture, if you look at all the models, all the versions of the APN model, uh, forfeitures continue to be the first option. Uh, of course, uh, the, the new draft have, uh, have created sort of a, a, of a, of a of a portfolio, if you will, of options that the parties can uh, uh, can adopt in the specific situations. But it's clear from the from the drafting of the of the of the contracts that the forfeiture continues to be the main provision for that situation. It, and it is for a very, uh, I think, for a very obvious reasons. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, oil and gas, as we all know, is is is, is, is an activity that where Investments are billionaires, and 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 and, and time is of the essence. Uh, uh, all the other options, you 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 probably will you drag yourself into some some sort of a, a, a complex litigation to determine their proper uh, applicability. So they are there; they can be used, and for a specific case, uh, they may be more interesting. They may be less uh, uh, draconian, if, if if you prefer. But uh, what is clear from the from the comparison of the models is that uh, the forfeiture used to be the chief option for for to, to remedy the specific uh, type of, of breach. Thank you, Gustavo. <clears throat> Mark, do you have anything to add on that that point? No, I mean, just to reiterate what Gustavo said, which is, uh, you know, I think this decision is, um, you know, a benefit to, um, you know, the industry generally and providing a bit more certainty around these provisions. And, you know, it's similar to the McDessey and Cavendish Square decision in, in, you know, English law, which has, you know, given a lot more comfort to people that these sorts of provisions are likely to be enforceable. Yeah, I, I would add to what Gustavo said. My, this is this is the view of Mike Lennon, uh, not the views of Mayor Brown. But I think the withering clause is just delay the inevitable because the typical situation here is where the party has gotten themselves into a financial problem and can't afford to pay or doesn't want to pay. And so you, you're just taking a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and that frustrates operation, that frustrates the ability of the operator to uh, you know, do business with the other paying partners. And the withering provision to me um, – has inherent tension with the pay first, discuss later principle that underlines the JOA. 
All right. I have a question here from Ron Ballmer. In the Taka case, why did the operator want to continue in its role as operator since operator makes no profit? Why was this position in its best interest? And the reason, I'll, I'll take that one, um, is because the operator controls the operation. And that is important because it controls the rate of capital investment by proposing what operations are conducted. Um, you know, almost everybody likes being the operator. <laughs> so once they're in that role, they don't want to give it up. Mark or Gustavo, any further thoughts on that? No, I, 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 I mean, I agree with that, Mike. I, I can't remember if there was also an economy of scale point in that case in, in terms of being an operator of multiple um, in multiple JOAs, but that's another reason that, that people tend to want to be operator. Okay, we have a question from Ben Wellmaker. Does the requirement for the defaulting party to relinquish its interest impinge on the rights of the government agency to control and approve any transfers of PSC or license interests? Excellent question. Gustavo, you want to have a go at that? Well, uh, it's, uh, uh, of course, uh, what, what we can comment on the recent brain the decision is that, uh, uh, of course, any any decision issued on on on, on between the parties of the the, the JOA uh, does not bind itself uh, to the agency. Who is not a party to any JOA uh, dispute. However, uh, what emerges from their decision is that they will uh, uh, enforce without. Getting, again, without getting into the merits of, of any decision or, or of any of the dispute among the parties, but they will uh, they will uh, uh, reflect the uh, the decisions, the new composition of interests from the JOA into the concession agreement. Yeah, and I think. Gustavo, you'd correct me if you think this is not right because you're the Brazilian lawyer and I'm not, but I think that there's an inherent pre-approval of the partners to a JOA by A&P, so it's not really an assignment to uh, an outsider that A&P would normally be concerned about. It's an assignment to somebody they already have you know, allowed to be uh, a party to a concession or a PSC or whatever the case may be. Yeah, but 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 again, but but in any case, it is an assignment of an interest. So the NP will do its 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 uh, its job of reviewing and determining that uh, that assignment is 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 in the best interest of the of the concession. Because, for example, you can uh, conceive of a situation in which. The transfer of the interest of, so to speak, parts A to parts B and C of a JOA, uh, that transfer puts uh, a, a, a very high participation for those parties. So the agency will have to check, for example, whether they have the financial capacity to, to incur in additional investments. Or this transfer can be, for example, the transfer of the operator's interest, in which so the agency will have to determine whether the new operator has the technical capacity to conduct the operations. So, uh, so essentially, uh, I mean, the agency will reveal uh, their requirements in order to 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 agree uh, with the with the assignments. But uh, what emerges with the decision is that uh, uh, they, uh, as long as there's no conflict with any mandatory requirement. They will enforce the, the decisions that the parties uh, directly or by an actual decision uh, have made. Okay, we have a question here from Pablo at Repsol, uh, and again, it goes to you. Uh, this your your issue, Gustavo, is clearly on people's minds. Sure, in relation sure. to uh, the Brazil, 
in relation to the Brazilian case, I'll just read it out for the benefit of everyone. Has the federal court ruling that confirmed the Brazilian Petroleum Agency decision validating the enforceability of the forfeiture clause under the JOA been challenged? So has there been an appeal of any sort? Well, yes. Uh, well, uh, this, this decision was issued by the by the uh, by a federal district court uh, in the in the in the circuit that uh, contemplates the state of Rio and state of of Espirito Santo, but it has not been appealed to the to the federal court of appeals. Uh, the decision, in any case, is being challenged by an arbitral proceedings here in Rio de Janeiro under the ICC rules. Um, unless I've missed it, I don't think we have any other questions, uh, but we have three and a half minutes to go in the program, so um, if you want to jump in on the Q&A line and ask a question, we're happy to take it. In the meantime, I'm going to go back to our CLE approval slide and show you that code one more time. Zero five, M as in mayor, B as in brown, one four, J as in John, A as in astronaut. That's the code you'll need to enter into the forms that you received in order to get CLE credit for today's program. Okay. Hopping back over to the question line. So there's a question about how can we download the materials. I think the program and I will be to email uh, the slide deck to everyone who um, attended today. Uh, Rebecca, is am I correct about that? Yes. All right. Okay, we've got another question from Ben. Shouldn't the AIPN stop using the word forfeiture in the model form? Isn't relinquishment better? Uh, that's a good question, Ben, and I think that's that's uh, a point well taken. Uh, <clears throat> because, but uh, I think it matters more in the civil law situations around the world than it does in the common law situations. We in the U.S. and under English law never really had any problem with the forfeiture provision. It's just uh, the way the game is played, the rules of the road. But Gustavo, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on whether relinquishment would be better terminology you know, under a civil law system. Well, I mean, uh, we uh, of course we 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 don't we don't use the the, the 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 first translation that the word forfeiture would have in Portuguese. Uh, so uh, normally, what for example, where, what the ANP, the terminology the ANP uses here uh, for that is is uh, compulsory assignment. Uh, so we we. we we don't use the the, 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 the the Portuguese equivalent equivalent word for forfeiture. Uh, uh, even though uh, I understand the, that the the, the, the the word may have some 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 connotation depending on the on the on the on the system that you are applying, uh, but uh, once you understand the, the Java model as a whole, you see that it is a system that works properly. Uh, uh, I don't think the terminology is really uh, 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 a, a, the, the main point of concern. You see, I think the, uh, the, the, the reason for the provision, why it applies, in which situation it applies, and what needs to happen before uh, it can be applied. Uh, 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 again, I understand some, some, some that, that the word may have some connotations in different systems, but it, 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 at least in the, in the litigation that I'm conducting here, that was not the issue. The, the, the issue was really uh, the actual implementation of the provision, whether uh, it, it would be proper 
to have an assignment of an interest without uh, compensation. That that is the issue. You see, it's it's not really uh, about the terminology. I I think. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, thank you all who joined us today. Um, we have come up to our one hour. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. We hope the information shared today was useful. Thank you so much for your participation. And as I said, the materials will be emailed to everyone who joined us uh, this morning or this afternoon or this evening, as the case may be where you sit. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.